Well, in the contemporary literature on fine-tuning, there are basically three explanatory options. Either physical necessity, that these constants and quantities must have the values they do, that it's not contingent. Or secondly, um, chance, and the form that this normally takes would be a kind of multiverse hypothesis, mm -hmm. um, and then an appeal to an observer selection, self-selection effect that we can only observe universes that are finely tuned for mm -hmm. our existence, so we shouldn't be surprised that somewhere in the infinite multiverse that we should appear um, in such a universe. And then the third one would be design, that there is an intelligence that has designed the universe. And Rogers' um, a special contribution, I think, to this has been to place a very significant objection and question mark behind the explanation of the multiverse hypothesis Before with the self-selection effect. Because if we were just a random member of a multiverse, we ought to be observing a much different universe than we do. Let, let, I want to come to that. I mean, first of all, on this question of fine tuning, which again, we might be worth just spelling out a little bit for, for the audience. Yes. Um, you you've yourself have, have contributed interestingly to this. Um, there, there's a certain um, aspect of, uh, of reality, the initial low entropy distribution of mass and energy. Now, <laughs> yes. without getting too technical at this point, um, this, is, this is essentially the, the idea that you were sort of alluding to earlier that at that very earliest moment, that singularity uh, of big, in Big Bang cosmology, there's an incredible amount of order mm. versus the mm. disorder, the entropy that, that appears later on that needs to be there in order for a, a life-sustaining universe to be possible. In fact, you put this extraordinary number on it of um, the precision <laughs> needed to be 1 in 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123, which I'm told is if you were to try to write that down there, and you put a zero on every single particle in the observable universe, it, you still wouldn't have enough zeros. Nowhere on this. close. <laughs> and, and, and so yes. <clears throat> this is mind-boggling stuff, but it, it appears, it, it appears mm. that as though uh, some, some, someone, as, as you know, um, uh, who was it who said that someone's been monkeying with the physics? Um, Hoyle. Uh, Hoyle <laughs> uh, Fred Hoyle said, it, it looks as though, as, as, as Bill has said, some sort of design is, is there to, to ensure that we, we got here. Now, yeah. now, what do you what do you say to that, that I, idea? Well, I'm I'm agnostic. I would say on that one. You see, it's not clear to me. I mean, people talk about about um, well, even the mass ratio between the proton and the neutron, and the fact that the neutron is just a little bit more massive than the proton, and it decays that way rather than the other way around, and so on. But but it's it's very difficult to. Since we only know one kind of life, you see, mm. or one kind of the production of consciousness, it may be very rare throughout the universe. We, I mean, the numbers may not all be that all that all that good. You see, you can imagine fiddling mm. with them so mm. that so that there were consciousnesses all over the place. You see, I don't know. You see, we don't know enough about that, and there are some nice examples from science fiction which show different alternatives. I like the one Fred Hoyle's idea of the. The black cloud you see where this was a completely different way of imagining a conscious being okay. which was this huge cosmic cloud which uh, communicated like this by electromagnetic signals and things like this. The other story which I like to r refer to is, is one um, by Robert Forward which was a uh, uh, dragon's egg I think was the name of the story where there was a neutron star which came close to the sun and uh, the people on the Earth went to explore it, and it turned out that there were living beings on this neutron star, which instead of using chemistry, they used nu nuclear processes. Mm. And this means that their lives and evolution took place millions of times faster than us. Mm. And how you can make a story with this complete <laughs> imbalance was an amazing <laughs> achievement, I yes. thought. But, but, but they even had a religion which took place in, in the Chilas, which were the inhabitants of this neutron star. And when the Earth was, then came close to them, they built their complete religion on, mm. on the star, which appeared, you see, in, in the So do, in the do you think it's, it's, I mean, these are obviously stories, but do you think yes. it's possible in a sense that some sort of conscious reality could exist uh, even in the absence of the physical 
sort of n- n- well, carbon-based life that we we obviously need. For it could have been done very differently in a different, totally different. You see, there are many different parts of the of the universe where the physics is very different from what it is on the Earth, and maybe a different kind of life could have evolved there. And uh, I have no idea. Right. I just that we don't know. There are puzzles, right, uh, which look like coincidental things. And they were one of the first ones was Hoyle's thing mm-hmm. about the uh, ca- energy level of carbon, mm-hmm. which hadn't been there. <laughs> then, then uh, you couldn't have got beyond evolution. Well, uh, Bill, what's your response to the, these sorts of ways of dealing with the fine tuning? Well, this is fascinating to me because, as I understand you, Roger, you're not advocating either physical necessity nor chance via the multiverse hypothesis and self-selection effect. Uh, nor design, but rather you would simply deny the fact of fine-tuning altogether, that the universe is not fine-tuned uh, for I embodied think deny is too strong. I say I don't know. You don't know. Yeah. And um, to me, that is um, highly implausible. Uh, I, it, we just find example after example of fine-tuning in contemporary physics, and it seems to me to be a desperate expedient to deny that it exists. Um, In the absence of fine-tuning, there wouldn't even be matter. Um, uh, There wouldn't be chemistry. So the idea that that other forms of life would evolve, I think, is um, logically possible, but it's not, I think, the most plausible solution to the problem. Well, I mean, we just know so little about what constitutes life mm-hmm. and how it, I mean, we, we have the universe we have and you could imagine cha- fiddling with the numbers and making them, to what extent that freedom is even there mathematically isn't clear. I, I, I think we just know, I mean, I can see the arguments and I can see there's a case for the arguments yeah. to say that, okay, from certain points of view, it looks as though there are accidental things about the constants of nature which have allowed things to happen which, if they hadn't happened, we wouldn't be here. And that's true. But maybe some other thing would be here which could mm-hmm. have... It's not at all mm. clear to me. I, I was wondering whether your the, the conformal cyclical model in any way sort of does the job of a multiverse in, in as much as, well, if the universe has sort of had these rebirths time and time and time again, perhaps we're living in the one that was habitable for human life. That's a possibility, yes. You see, there could be an evolution of constants. I mean, this was an idea that John Wheeler put forward, not with this model, but with other models, with the sort of bouncing universe models, that maybe each time there was a new set of constants produced and they were different each time, and we happen to be living in the particular eon, if I could use that word here, uh, in which the constants happen to to suit the kind of life, at least, that we... The experience. So, so that's potentially a, a solution. Well, what now, do you think, Bill? That solution seems to me to fall prey to the very argument that you give against using the anthropic principle with respect to the multiverse. Because what you've done in trying to push the conformal cyclical model to past infinity is, in effect, establish a multiverse, mm-hmm. except it's sequentially ordered rather yeah. than mm. s- oh, simultaneous. Sure. And no, in that case, then the question is, yeah. why do we observe a fine-tuned universe like this instead of the one which is unfathomably more probable that is, say, no larger than our solar system, a patch of order that is um, that big? That would be unfathomably more probable than a fine-tuned universe. And indeed, maybe we're all just Boltzmann brains with no, no. illusions, one, <laughs> illusions of the external world around us. Uh, why? No. No, it, it, it falls prey to this very objection I don't that you've raised. No, it's an answer. You see, I'm not giving this answer because I don't okay. like it. Okay. So <laughs> this isn't your favorite. This it's e- not my favorite, but it is a possible right. answer. Right. That the eons are different. That the numbers differ. Yeah. They can't differ by very much from observational point of view. Mm. But they, I mean, some of them don't differ by very much, but they could differ and they could evolve. Yes, Yes. it's certainly possible. I I don't uh, like it, but it's a possibility. (laughs)